Off to a good start. <laughs> already broke it. So the, apparently this is uh, going to be the second best talk, because Adam's already given the, the best talk of the, the session. So I just want to give an overview of Havoc physics within the DOTS framework. Um, and I'm, I'm really going to touch just briefly on the, the Havoc and Unity partnership. There's a ragdoll demo going on over there. Uh, a look at Unity physics and the sort of systems in place there. Adam's already touched on some of them, if you've already seen his talk. And then I really want to um, emphasize the differences between Unity and Havoc. Uh, before sort of touching on some of the potential um, roadmap ideas that we have going forward. So at GDC, uh, we announced a partnership to put the Havoc technology inside Unity. Um, if you don't know Havoc, uh, we've been powering AAA game titles for since the last millennium, in fact, um, on many different platforms. Do you want to replace it now? Yeah. OK. Testing. OK. Take two. Should I start at the beginning? So here are some of the, the titles that uh, we're, we're powering at the moment. Uh, maybe not just physics, but uh, also some of the other technology pieces that Havoc have. And we're on on the platforms that everyone's going to be interested in. Um, just as a bit of an anecdote, I walked into the local supermarket um, shelves, and I sort of thought I'd put a Havoc logo beside all the titles that were in. A bit of double counting, but we'll ignore that. Um, and that's just sort of a representative show of, of the sort of titles that are being powered by Havoc at the moment. But we really want to work together with Unity to put the Havoc technology out to as many people as possible. Um, so let's see how that's going to actually work. So if we're looking at Unity physics, Adam gave a, a very good overview of that particular um, side of things. But I am going to touch and repeat a few things that he said as well, just to highlight specific areas that um, that need to be um, touched on so that we can see what the differences are between the two core simulations. Um, and arguably, whenever I'm talking about these systems at the start, we're really talking about maybe a dots physics rather than a unity physics, because the idea is that we want to have a data-orientated approach um, so that, as Adam said, we can have a back end that's maybe focused on simulation for uh, robotics or a simulation for fast performance in a, in a game environment. So the very big overall picture for ECS is the number of the conversion pipeline from the game object world uh, to create the entity data uh, that we covered in the last um, talk with the physics components, like the physics collider and the physics velocity. And then there's the build physics system that is taking that data, converting it into a, a different, slightly different format that's optimized for runtime and, and a large number of random access queries. And then there's the step physics. And this is the piece that we're really going to talk about in this, in this talk, uh, because it's the one um, piece that can be swapped out. We're using the same data from the authoring side through to the, the I component data. All of that's going to be fed into Unity physics or Havoc physics. So we want to touch a little bit more on what's going on there. And then once that system has done its work, uh, the final export physics system takes that optimized for runtime data and puts it back into your component ECS data. So what sort of data is going into the step physics world? There's only really two sets of information. The collision information, which was the uh, colliders that Adam showed how you can convert from um, your scene data and the transform, the, the position in space and the rotation. But there's also the dynamic information um, at a particular point in time, which would be the velocity, the center of mass, the orientation of that body in, in motion space. And whenever the step physics world does its, its thing, you're going to get out a second set of this dynamics information at a second time. The fact that we've got a collision world and a dynamics world, a dynamics physics world, means that you can be doing queries on that old T0 information at the same time as the physics is performing its simulation to move all that, all that data to T, T1. The other set of information that you're getting out of the simulation back end is a set of contacts and triggers. So contacts, obviously, I have collided with this um, bit of the floor, and you might use that to spark off 
uh, sound, or you might use it to spark off some particle effects like sparks. Um, and also triggers. You've got an overlapping object. I've entered a particular area. I've got a particular um, area that's represented for an explosive force. And that would be part of the, the trigger in event information. So let's dig in a little bit into the step physics world. So there's three main stages that we want to look at. Um, how familiar is everyone with sort of rigid body collision detection and response? A few hands up. Excellent. So I might be repeating myself a little bit, but it's worth highlighting some of these pieces. So we'll, we'll talk about the broad phase, the narrow phase, and, and the solve step. So both, if we take the data to one side, it's going to be a common data that's entering into the, the step physics world. Unity physics and Havoc physics are both a speculative continuous collision detection um, set of implementations. So that means that at the first step, when we're dealing with the broad phase overlaps, we're expanding the ABB of a dynamic body by the velocity that that body is um, moving at. Um, and we're using both the linear and the angular velocity to, to make that ex expanded shape. So that uh, rather than just having a, the dynamic, so any time I show a, an image here, the um, sort of, you'll see a sort of checkerboard type gray color for static bodies and a orange color for dynamic bodies, orange yellow color. So in this particular case, because we've, the ball is moving down to the right and we've expanded the ABB, we're getting overlaps onto the static pieces. So the first stage is to find all of those dynamic, dynamic overlaps and also the dynamic static overlaps. And we want to get those array separately. And once that piece is done, you're getting a call back that you can go, I now want to look at this data and manipulate it if you want. So there is a, a simulation callback at this stage where you can, um, it's called uh, post create dispatch pairs. And you might want to use this in a game use case, for example, where you want to turn off collision detection between a bunch of bodies that you've spawned in the world and they're all overlapping each other, but they're going to explode anyway. So you don't want those pieces colliding with each other and you know they're going to be exploding out. So I might as well remove all of the overlapping pairs for that particular use case. Now you could do that with a collision filter, but you don't really want to have to mess about with that sort of authoring data uh, in a runtime environment. So that's a, a good use case for that particular callback um, at the prod phase overlap level. The next point when you're dealing with the narrow phase, um, you're creating all of those contact points. You're getting the normal, you're getting the closest, the closest distance to the, the objects that you've overlapped with in the previous section. Um, but you've also got another callback, um, post-create contacts. And what you might want to do with this is either maybe back-face culling on a, on a mesh object so that you can only collide in one particular direction based on face winding. Or it might be a, like a displacement map type idea. So even though I, I might have a flat tessellated plane um, for my level, I could have a, a callback at this point so that I add a little bit of a jitter to the contact normals as, as the body moves across and adds a little bit of detail. So the last point then is the solve, where we're building our contact Jacobians. Please don't ask me what a Jacobian is or how to describe it. It's a magic box. Um, but we're creating two types of uh, Jacobians. Uh, friction ones for the contacts, so the body sliding across the floor or stacking on top of each other. And then the trigger Jacobians for just an overlap um, of uh, so a body entering a particular volume. And at this particular point, there's a, another callback that you can hook in to the system. So it's very important to note that we're trying to make sure that this is not a black box that you can see the data clearly going in, you see the data clearly going out, and you can process and manipulate that data as it goes through the pipeline. So in this particular case, the, the Create Context Jacobian is, is useful if you're wanting to do something like fake mass inertia. So you might have a physical body in the scene. Um, you might want to have like debris bodies that are quite light but still dynamic and would effectively move, say, um, a character off from its position. But at this point, we could hijack the contact, uh, the contact Jacobian, and pretend for that moment that the character has got an infinite mass. Um, so you can do a lot of uh, interesting things with that. Another idea is like a soft contact. I could allow the collision response to be slightly less than it would be in a, in a, if I just left it to its own devices. 
Um, and another example might be a conveyor belt. You don't actually want to have a moving conveyor belt in the scene if you can get away with it. So if you just have a static box, but you can fake a surface velocity, and that's at this point in the, in the, uh, the flow of the, the simulation, where you could grab the contact points or the contact Jacobians with that conveyor belt object and pretend that there is an actual surface velocity and uh, have it move along. And finally, we're actually solving all of those Jacobians. And it's worth highlighting that we solve the, the static contacts last. So we can make the dynamic, dynamic overlaps and contacts get processed and solved. And then the static overlaps with the dynamic objects get solved. Now, I just want to highlight uh, one title that's already out in the world. It's on Steam. You can, you can go and grab it right now. And they're building a, a sandbox where you can put your own systems together. Um, and it's quite amazing how many um, t sort of physics toys the community's already created. Um, and this is downloadable now. It's using uh, Unity Physics. Um, and the Reddit thread is actually quite am amusing to, to see all the sort of different experiments people are doing. So inside the Unity Physics package, it's providing all of those callbacks. It's dealing with all that information. Hopefully, you can see that you could replace that with your own if you wanted. Um, you could expose the same sort of callbacks and allow other people to manipulate your simulation. But in the Unity Physics package that you download today, we've got the build physics world and the step physics world. But ultimately, what the step physics world is doing is it's providing a I simulation interface, and it's providing three implementations. One is just a dummy simulation so that you could um, have no integration going on. You would just have your collision world and do static queries, but you could set up a step physics world to, to be um, simulating nothing and doing nothing with a the simulation. There is a simulation implementation, which is the Unity physics. And there's also, inside the Unity physics package, there is an implementation called Havoc Simulation. Now, it doesn't do anything whenever you just have the Unity physics package on its own, but it's there so that you can sort of hot swap in the UI for the moment. So if we start looking at, at Havoc Physics then and, and some of the deep differences between Unity Physics and Havoc Physics. Havoc Physics has been released. I think it was released yesterday. It's available in the Package Manager for download. Uh, make sure you show uh, preview packages in order to see it listed in the, in the scene. Um, and it has a, a dependency on the very latest Unity Physics at the moment as well. In order to turn on Havoc Physics, if you've got any demos that, well, you can actually get the, the Unity Physics demos from, from GitHub. And in order to turn all of those demos over to using Havoc Physics, there is one prefab with all the physics settings in it, and it's just a matter of changing from Unity Physics over to Havoc Physics. The same authoring data is used for the conversion. The same component data is used for the runtime. And at this particular point, we're just swapping out the back end. Now, that's not to say there's not going to be some differences between Unity and Havoc. So let's look at those. They fall under two main categories, performance and behavior. Um, and let's look at sort of the individual pieces uh, in each of those two main, two main areas. The first one is in penetration recovery. Now, I could repeat this every slide, uh, and Adam's already said it, but the core difference going on here is the fact that Unity Physics is stateless. We're trying to be able to say all the data is there. You can just replace it with a previous frame and have the simulation continue. Havoc Physics has got a cache, and, and it is a stateful physics engine. So it's getting a lot of benefit from that. And arguably, all of these differences come back to this has got state, this has got state. So rather than putting it on every slide, state versus cached, or stateless versus cached, I'm just going to say it now. And hopefully, you won't have to get um, an earful of it every frame. So what is penetration recovery? In this particular example, we've got, again, the tessellated, or the um, checkerboard are static objects, and the orange or the yellowy havoc type color are dynamic bodies. So what we've got here is various levels of penetration between the dynamic bodies within static bodies and within other dynamic bodies. Now, because Unity Physics is has no state, um, has no cache, we have to be a little bit more aggressive. The solver is a little bit harder in dealing with interpenetrations with static bodies. And again, we also already mentioned that we solve those static um, contacts 
at the end um, just to make sure that they're not violated. So that means that whenever we do actually run the simulation here from this starting ground, the more something is interpenetrating with the static body, the more aggressive that push out from the static body is. But you also see it's a much smoother uh, flow out of an interpenetrating state between two dynamic bodies. So you have no option but getting that particular behavior. But if you do move to havoc physics, the nature of the cache means that we can control that um, penetration recovery. If you want the explosive force, you know, you certainly opt that in and add that force yourself based on the penetration depth, but at least you've got an option now. So that's one difference. And just here, here are the, the, the two together just for visual highlighting. So what you're also seeing here is the, the debug display that Adam mentioned in the previous, um, the previous talk. So the green boxes that you're seeing, the contact points that you're seeing, that's all debug information that you can use to um, test out what's going on in the world. Um, just at the moment, actually, the debug information is a frame behind the actual visual, um, the graphical representation. So a lot of people have been asking for this in the forum. Um, stacking is a, is a big issue with the friction model that's in Unity Physics. Uh, it means that we don't have that cache to deal with the velocities over frames. So stacking is a bit of an issue. Uh, the forum did ask for, you know, three bodies stacked on top of each other, but with Havoc Physics, um, you can actually stack quite a, a signif significant amount more. <laughs> and as of this morning, we have our first release of a game, if you can call it that, uh, using Havoc Physics. So it was only released yesterday, and someone's already put something up on, on Twitter. So they are really pushing the, the stacking uh, within Havoc Physics. So restitution, bounciness, um, is another issue. Each one of these scenarios that I'm showing here is kind of a worst case scenario. It's just to really illustrate the differences between these two back ends. Um, but they are representative of all of the sort of use cases that come up in game development. So restitution or bounciness, this example demo that I'm going to show here uh, is, is a worst case scenario in that it's 12,000 convex hulls all piled up on top of a static mesh. Um, we'll, we'll use that uh, for performance differences later as well, but there's two things going on. This character is spawning a large number of these convex hulls every frame, so there's a little bit of interpenetration going on, and there's also a high restitution on these values or on these convex hulls on the material properties. Within Unity Physics, both of the <laughs> Uh, interpenetration energy that's gained and the restitution model, which is not quite as, um, I'm always worried about the, the word here, but maybe refined is, is, is reasonable enough, means that you get this effect. Now, you might want that effect, that's fine, but at least with Havoc, you don't have to have it or you can have it if you want. So you, they are still bouncy, but the uh, penetration recovery is not causing a large amount of energy to come out. So just the two of them together. Now, I, I will point out there was a, a large amount of time spent. We don't want to knock one engine and promote one, another engine. There's, there's different use cases in here. You may want that. Um, so it's, it's up to you to choose which one, you, which one you want to prefer. So I already mentioned that we're a speculative co uh, continuous collision detection. We're not going to get performance spikes. Uh, in the way previous um, iterations of Havoc and other engines had. But we do have other issues that come up from that particular approach we use. Um, and that's with speculative contacts. So in this particular image here, we're actually picking up, these, these are the boxes sliding down a tessellated mesh, um, and we're picking up edges off an upcoming triangle. And you can see that the normal for those, those edges are actually going towards the box as the box slides down. So that's, sometimes it's called a ghost collision. It's a speculative contact where the contact normal of the edge that you're seeing, and this is a, a mesh with two, ed, with two triangles and we're approaching from the, from the left and we end up hitting the edge of the second triangle which acts like a contact normal and deflects the ball uh, up into the air. Now with mesh, Meshes, we can sort of get away with that. So in this particular, this is one of the examples that's in the 
the Unity sample set. Here is a sort of jittering type uh, collision response from you're getting from those speculative contacts. But one approach you could do is to use the callbacks that we talked about earlier, take the contact information that you uh, are provided, and just mess with the normal, turn it to be the face normal rather than the edge normal of the, of the upcoming triangle. Or in the particular demo, we just go, we, we know that this is a flat plane, really, even though it's tessellated for whatever reason. Um, and we can just set the contact normals to be all the same. Now, that's not necessarily going to be appropriate for the generic use cases. Uh, it might be absolutely perfectly fine for yourselves. It does highlight the fact that we want people to be able to dig into the, the core um, source code and enhance it for their particular game use case. Um, so here is the particular demo. We're just you can see that the speculative contacts, while we're, we're picking them up, we're also rotating and scaling those contacts so they don't actually have an effect on the box as it slides along. And as I say, it might be good enough for um, a specific use case that you're looking for. But it's much more difficult whenever it comes to dealing with um, coming up on the edge of a body as you move. So again, with a, with a triangle mesh, you can get some of that information from the mesh. If you're coming up on a body, again, you're picking up the contact point because you've expanded the ABB of the, of the dynamic body. You pick up a speculative contact point, and again, you get the deflection, which shouldn't really be there. So when we come to unity physics, this particular is just a worst case scenario again, and you probably wouldn't be firing tiny balls through the world. You'd probably be using ray casts, but it does highlight the issues. This is a set of corridors, a very thin corridor in the middle, um, and sort of slightly wider ones to either side. We can see from the fact that the ABBs get smaller when the bodies come out the other side of the, the corridors, that the velocity has been trimmed because of the contacts that are picked up. And it might be difficult to see, but you can see that the, the balls that are firing along the edges of the, the larger tunnels are actually being deflected in towards the center because they're picking up those speculative hits. And again, the visual um, debug functionality that's inside Unity physics um, highlights this sort of information as well, which is quite useful. Might be difficult to see, but you can actually sort of see the actual contact points and see where they're coming up and, and step it over time. So with Havoc, this is one of those um, things that we don't necessarily want to enable out of the box. There's a, there's a small performance hit in order to deal with these speculative contacts. So we don't turn it on by default for Havoc. There is a Havoc configuration um, authoring component that you can add on to uh, an entity that's, that's dealing with your, your core physics setup. And one of those options is that you can set up a particular custom tag, that sort of the body tags that, that Adam was talking about in the last um, session. And you could set one of those up to say, I want to enable, we're calling it welding, that's subject to change because welding works on a, on a mesh level, but it doesn't work between bodies. Um, but if you could set up a particular tag to say, anything with this tag should deal with those speculative contacts, those ghost collisions um, in the world. And so when you have that turned on and opted into in Havoc, you can see that the bodies fly through the, the corridors, they don't get their velocity trimmed, and we're dealing with those ghost collisions. It's also worth highlighting that you might not hit this scenario. Um, you're really only going to see these things whenever you're dealing with larger time steps, um, with fast moving objects, uh, especially over that sort of use case, which is a flat tessellated terrain. Now that use case, uh, th those were sort of fake, exaggerated use cases. A real use case might be a vehicle. So uh, this is a vehicle with low suspension. That isn't quite flat, so there is a little bit of a jump from the suspension. But, you know, again, if you want the rodeo type effect, you can have it, but it's not something you have to take with the Havoc um, opt-in option. Okay. So the last piece uh, is on performance. Um, and part of that is deactivation. So this is on by default because I can't actually think of a use case why you wouldn't want things that aren't doing anything to fall asleep. Um, but again, it is toggleable if you do need to force everything active every single frame. At a high level, you, know, you can see that 
the, the blue boxes, any object with a blue box around it is active at the minute. It's going through its collision detection and, re and response. And then after a few frames, it'll be deactivated and a certain clusters of objects will sort of just turn off and not sort of deal with um, any simulation each frame. Reactivation then happens uh, whenever a body moves through the world and overlaps with that group of deactivated objects. And it just turns on that specific group of deactivated objects. Now this looks trivial, but it's actually one of the hardest things that is lots of tendrils in the Havoc uh, SDK. There's a lot of scenarios um, where deactivation um, comes into play. If you're adding and removing the bottom object from a stack, you need to reactivate. If you're firing a ray cast and you want to apply a force, you need to make sure you're reactivating on that force apply. Um, and of course, you need to reactivate if you're going to actually bounce off things. So it, in certain cases, um, it's possible to do. You know, you might, uh, some uh, Havoc physics users are maybe just, rather than deactivating, turning, making a um, set of bodies that aren't really moving very much, you might make them static rather than dynamic. Um, and, and that's quite, actually, that's an interesting use case because it just means they have to remove the, the physics uh, velocity component from their entity, and that makes it static. So it's actually quite easy to do that. Um, but then they have to do the, the spaghetti code in order to make sure that they reactivate things appropriately. And if your game, if you know your, the use case in your game very well, that might not be a problem. Work away. Um, but if you want to sort of opt into Havoc physics, um, this is one of the things that are, that are done for you. So finally, I want to just touch on, on the CPU use case. Um, again, we'll go back to this previous demo. 12,000 convex holes all piled up on top of each other. Pretty extreme example, of course, but what we're seeing is roughly about a 2x performance increase um, on, on the, these sort of scenes between Unity and uh, Havoc Physics. Yeah, that's scaled. I don't know how to <laughs> present it in a slightly better way. But um, you actually can end up with a much better performance increase um, whenever you're dealing with a larger environment with um, bodies that are scattered around the scene rather than all piled up on top of each other. And then deactivation kicks in and you're actually only simulating you know, one or two of those bodies at any particular point in time where your character is sitting. So finally, I want to just touch on, on something that's in the Havoc SDK, or sorry, in the Havoc physics plugin. Um, and that's an option for a much more detailed uh, investigation tool. So this was an early version of the planet gravity demo where something went wrong. I will, I'll ask, does anybody, can anybody guess what the problem is here? No. Sorry? Um, it is, but the main problem is that the planet accidentally had a box shape instead of a sphere. And if you're only looking at the graphics, then you're, never, you know, you're going to start looking at center of mass and where your forces are being applied and having to deal with all of those what-if scenarios. But because you've got a, the physics debug display option, which we do need to optimize, we do need to make it faster, but you just turn it on and you can immediately then see what the problem is in a visual way. Within the Havoc plugin, there's, there's something called the Havoc uh, Visual Debugger, and it's just basically a much more detailed version of that. If you are uh, got the plugin installed, you will see an extra menu under the analysis, um, the window analysis menu, uh, called the Havoc Visual Debugger. And it can give you a lot more detail and deal with much bigger simulation scenarios than the built-in Unity Physics debug information. It is a Windows PC client, uh, but it does connect remotely to whatever, wherever the game is running on, whatever platform the, the game is running on. It's got a scrubbable timeline, so you can pause the game and scrub backwards and forwards and try and find that exact po point that maybe a, a collision response isn't acting quite nicely. It's got a lot of data visualizations, like just seeing the colliders, but you're also seeing the contact points. You can see in this particular example, we've got the motion trails, um, it, which is Brilliant. We're actually probably wanting to put it into Unity Physics, but uh, it shows you the motion over time. You can start to see some of the, the pieces there deactivating and going green, uh, although obviously at the moment a lot of them are, um, are active and, and representing in blue. 
You've also got the performance metrics, which dig down and, and show you uh, information quite like the, the profiler in Unity itself. And you can actually, inside the Visual Debugger, pick up bodies, move them around, and they will update on your game as well or in the editor. So there is an actual two-way interaction there as well. One of the particular uh, visualizers I want to highlight is the heat map. We're, we're finding a lot of use cases where both the designers as well as the programmers are, are finding this useful. Um, this is basically highlighting graphically where the CP lo CPU load for the simulation is in space. Um, and it's quite nice to see the sort of heat map expand as, as you start piling on bodies on top of each other in that, uh, that previous 12,000 convex hull demo. So uh, sort of a little pause and, and show some real game use cases um, where they have sent in their visual debugger information uh, for us to look at and try and help them debug a particular problem in the physics world. So there's a little bit of customization the guys have done here. You can see in the bottom corner, this is a, they're using a, a pencil type shape for the character controller, which is interesting. They're actually drawing the camera view frustrum as well in those sort of cyan colored rays. Obviously, there was a large explosion there, and they were drawing the forces that they were applying on the objects. Uh, and these are some of the vehicles, obviously. In, well, maybe not, maybe it's not obvious. But can anyone name the game? Ha <laughs> ha! Well done. I wish I had like a T-shirt gun I could send out swag. Um, so that's the same sort of scenario, only with the the large amounts of particle effects added into the scene. The explosions do make a bit of a difference but I could watch that all day. This is interesting because the red boxes are supposed to be axis aligned, but obviously not, they're not on the canonical X, Y, Z axis. So in this particular case, we're standing on a planet about where Spain would be. Can anybody guess the game? Well done. So I, I believe this is the actual planet that they were going down onto, because you can see those sort of spiked curve structures whenever the, the spaceship lands. So it's very interesting that those game developers are sending us the visual information, and we can help debug the sort of scenarios just from that physics information itself. And also, it, and being able to visualize that immediately lets you see specific problems, like the planet being a box rather than a sphere. Okay, so just want to summarize the sort of core differences, and hopefully this isn't just marketing speak, it's just to give you information. Um, so we are using the same data. We are getting better performance. We are getting better behavior, or behavior that you can opt into if you want. Um, and all of this technology and all of the core underlying Havoc simulation is, is definitely battle-hardened, and some of the games that are using it uh, we saw directly there. And this is available now in the package manager. Please go grab it, and please give us feedback on the forum and on what, you, what your experiences are. There's a lot of stuff in the Havoc Physics SDK that isn't maybe necessarily represented in the component data interfaces at the moment. And I just want to show some of the things that are in, in Havoc Physics that we could enhance the Havoc Physics offering um, more with these features. Uh, one of them is convex decomposition. The SDK at the minute is providing uh, simplification of convex objects into convex hulls. It's dealing with um, data that's very noisy and still producing convex hulls that are quite good. Um, it's pr <laughs> producing unstable cows and horses. Um, and it, it, the use case is a little bit less um, common, but it can break down sort of static environment into sort of a series of convex holes based on the level of detail you want. Another option is uh, optional penetration recovery. This is useful if the designers are wanting to put a specific stack of dynamic objects in the scene, but they don't necessarily want to line them up perfectly so you don't get that sort of initial, hopefully we've all seen that, where a stack of boxes just sort of have to settle and move a little bit. Um, but we can turn that off and we can ignore certain contact points that stop objects going further into penetrative state, but allows them to come apart. Again, useful for that sort of explosion use case, um, or just means that the de designers can be a little bit more lenient when they're placing dynamic objects around the scene. Havoc Physics has also got a much more accurate um, aerodynamic model, if, if that's needed, and a buoyancy system there as well, although the boat attack demo that you can see on the stage with the universal render 
Um, they have been playing with doing the buoyancy in dots already, which is quite interesting. Um, and there's also a, a pretty big piece in the Havoc Physics SDK. Haven't worked a good name out for it, uh, but lower fidelity rigid bodies um, is a reasonable term. This might mean that we could have something, we've had physics collider as a component, we've got physics mass, we've got physics velocity. We could have a physics quality um, component. Now, that, that particular component might not do anything with the Unity physics backend, but it could actually use the lower fidelity rigid bodies that are available in Havoc physics. And you're getting, on top of Havoc physics, you're getting another eight times CPU performance increase. And here's some examples. So that worst case scenario of piling 12,000 bodies on, on the surface, it now becomes possible with the sort of um, performance you can get from these lower fidelity rigid bodies. And it's not just, um, well, actually, this particular um, scene at the bottom with the, we're shooting up bodies, the, we're showing the difference between what would happen if you used a full fat rigid body, full fat, is that the right term, um, or the low fidelity version, and you can see the sort of performance graph on the, on the bottom and see what the differences are there. They're not going to be as accurate. They're not going to be uh, perfectly stackable. Uh, there are going to be trade-offs, but they are going to be incredibly cheap. And you could have a sixed-off version where you're having rolling boxes, and you can have an even simpler one that's just a 3 dof particle, uh, as, as the one in the top uh, right. Here, we're, not, we're actually colliding with a full mesh geometry for every single particle there, but it's a 3 dof uh, version, so it's, it's a lot more performant. So that is me. Uh, I'll hang around for questions after this. Uh, we are on the Expo Partners area on the Microsoft GameStack booth. Um, and I am going to be at the expert bar tomorrow as well if there's any more detailed questions, but I'm happy to take questions now as well if anybody has any. I think there's microphones up there if anybody does want to ask. Yeah. Uh, um, what about soft bodies? Soft, we're entirely soft. focused on rigid body simulators. So the question okay. was, what about soft bodies? Yeah. Uh, we are entirely focused on, on rigid bodies within these packages at the moment. Um, that said, things like the soft contact modifier um, would let you introduce a, a soft body type response and in the collision, but it, it really is something that you would have to put into your own game. Okay, and about the springs and all those uh, connectors between rigid bodies? Constraints? Yeah. OK, like so we, the runtime, as Adam said in his talk, there is the runtime uh, contacts, or sorry, Jacobians for constraints. Uh, we have ball and socket. We have um, prismatic. We have a sort of a, a, a rope type constraint. Um, we have a ragdoll constraint specifically for hips. The piece that's missing, that's all there. That's all there in the runtime at the minute. The piece that's missing is really the authoring and letting you set that sort of stuff up. Um, that is there in the samples. There are some example authoring pipelines for the, some of those constraints. But that is a focus that Adam and the Unity team are going to be looking at um, in the next couple of months. Did that answer your question? Sorry, I can't see where you are. Yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. OK, brilliant. Anything else? Is this Hello. Oh, oh hey. sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, how well have a physics integrates with dots? Are, well, are there any disadvantages using have a physics instead of using physics? Um, at the moment, physics is entirely focused on the, the game object side of things. Um, and Unity and phys Havoc physics is entirely focused on dots. Some of the advantages might be uh, one that came up on the, the boat attack sample was if you're trying to apply a, a buoyancy model to a rigid body, um, in mono behavior, you're applying that function on every, every object in their own specific mono behavior. In the dots world, applying those sort of forces is in one job, and you can stream through the, all of the data that has, a, say, a buoyancy component on it. So there's actually some significant performance benefits for the DOTS approach whenever you're coming to a, a lot of uh, physics use cases. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. OK, thank you. Anything else?
So, do you have the demos publicly available? The demos are, let me just, I can bring the demos up here. Um, these demos are available on the GitHub repo with the standard entity component system samples. So there's a Unity physics sample subfolder in that GitHub repo. Sorry, I should have had a slide with that particular talk or with that particular um, project linked to it. Um, but all of the, the samples are there showing individual setup scenarios where we've got um, things like, uh, let me see, where we're messing with the inertia tensor on the bodies. And so whenever we play this, uh, some values have got an inertia tensor where they're not allowed to rotate. Some have got sort of a, like a, a weeble where their, their weight's at the bottom. Um, the samples are really there for you to play with individual pieces of the physics system and, and get an understanding of what each component does, whether you just want to mess about with mass, whether you want to mess about with constraints, or whether you want to mess about with the inertia tensor so you see that the boxes aren't falling over or they're falling over slowly because we're messing about with the inertia tensor. Uh, someone did ask about constraints, so this is an example um, that goes through setting up each of these, and this is kind of like a, a joint parade where we can see all of the different constraints. Uh, there's a little bit of, this is a sort of an issue that uh, the, the guys are trying to improve. Um, the pause here as the game starts is burst compiling all of the scripts. Um, they are looking at caching that in, in, I think, 2020. I can't exactly remember which version of the editor. Uh, but here we're seeing the, the different constraints that are possible. Um, so let me see if I can zoom in here. We've got a prismatic constraint here. Uh, linking the dynamic, or the dynamic and the static body. We've got a, a hinge. Uh, this is a limited hinge. This is just a point-to-point. -point. Oh, that's a, the ragdoll demo, or the ragdoll constraint, sorry. So we can go in here and see the sort of visualizations um, 